Hello, everybody. I, uh, you know, when I was when I was getting started in my career, there were a lot of things I thought I'd be able to do. But doing a workshop where almost 5,000 people sign up is one that I never thought would happen. So thank you all for being here. This is, I was just, you know, we have this group chat going, the five of us on the screen, I'll introduce everyone. And I just said, you know, few people get to do this. And together, we basically, I'm going to get to this at the end of my presentation, we get to learn about a game that most people don't even know exists. And that is how to be a citizen of the internet, what it means to build a purse monopoly and have a compounding advantage that works for you in your career. And that's what we're going to spend the next 90 minutes exploring. And I know that we said it was only going to be an hour, but I called Jack up. I said, hey, man, we got to do a Q&A. And then I invited Ana Fabrega, who is a model personal monopoly. And she's going to talk about, she's one of my students, and she's going to talk about how in the past year she has actually built hers in the Q&A. Ana, why don't you introduce yourself from the 305? That's right. Hey, everyone. I'm Ana. Um, I'm from Panama, former elementary school teacher. Um, and in the past year, I sort of became a citizen of the internet. Um, now I'm a content creator and entrepreneur building alternative learning experiences online, starting with Synthesis, which if you have kids ages seven through 14, you better check it out. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But yeah, I'm excited to share my experience and how finding my personal monopoly has helped me in this journey this past year. And then I'm going to kick it over to Jack Butcher, you know, uh, it's pretty cool. Like there's probably no two creators in the world that I'm more bullish on than Anna and Jack. And to be able to have them here to share what they're thinking about uh, is really exciting for me. Jack put together some slides building off personal monopoly that were a huge improvement. And Jack is just an all time creator. And Jack, welcome. Why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me. Jack Butcher, um, David, I can't remember when we met initially. It's got to have been a couple of years ago in New York in person. And this was kind of the early days of working on the internet for me. And since then, I've taken a lot of the principles you've talked about to heart, experimented a lot, and hopefully codified a few things that can help other people uh, sort of reverse engineer the process that I've been through over the last couple of years. So yeah, excited to share a couple of slides on it. Great. Okay. So the concept of a personal monopoly, I'm going to try and break this down into a couple of visual explanations that can you know, help you overlay some of these frameworks on your experience to start to move in this direction yourself. So David, again, thanks for having me here. If you're not already, definitely get to follow David on Twitter, posts quality content all the time around this very uh, interesting emerging subject of a personal monopoly. So let's break down what a personal monopoly is. So I've been thinking about this ever since I started working online a couple of years ago and just slowly refined how specific the work I've been doing uh, has been in the course of those two years or so. So in retrospect, trying to figure out what are these elements that come together to build a personal monopoly. And this is where I'm at with... Uh, with breaking that down. So you have these three elements, uh, the first being competence down there on the bottom left, the second being curiosity and the third being character. So how do these three elements combine to form something unique, which is represented by the middle of this diagram? Uh, really, there's three stages to building a personal monopoly as I see it. Uh, the first being, what do you care about? So, you know, subject matter, the ability to consistently show up and talk about something. Competence is what you're good at. So your ability to deliver a result against that curiosity. And then the final piece, which may be the most elusive and hardest to deploy is who you are, what, what is unique to you, uh, your personality traits, how that comes through in the things you produce. So if we look at that in the context of the market, I just want to build this idea up. So competence is, is not enough to build a personal monopoly, right? There are plenty of people who are good at X. So being competent at something 
puts you in a, uh, a field where there's plenty of competition. Uh, you're competing purely on, you know, a, a marginal difference in your ability. If you add curiosity to that mix, you narrow the competition slightly. So uh, the person who is competent is going to lose to the person who is 10 times more curious and therefore explores a bunch of different things, uh, goes off in directions that the competent person might not. So this, this small adjustment in curiosity that may even combine things outside of the field that you're operating in with your competence, again, shrinks that area of competition. And uh, these arrows represent kind of how far you can go as a result of combining those two unique things. And then finally, once you add yourself into the mix here, you're completely unique. You completely eradicate competition because you've combined these three things. You have the ability, you have the curiosity to pursue it to a degree that other people won't. And then your unique spin on this, your character, your personality, the intangible things that make you you that you combine with this pursuit uh, in public. So to now talk about, okay, those three elements come together to sort of inform what you're going to talk about or, or what you're going to spend time working on. But then the, the next stage of that journey is packaging. So uh, I'm not an economist, so excuse any uh, economic terms I use out of context here. But the idea of a monopoly is something you achieve by producing something uh, that dominates in a certain market. So uh, to use this, this analogy, I'm going to try and explain how uh, packaging is the next sort of piece of that puzzle. So you've, you've combined these three things into this intangible combination. So if this diagram on the left represents you arriving at that place where you found your competence, your curiosity, and you're leaning into your personality, your job then becomes making that tangible. So in the context of what we're talking about today, we're talking about publishing content on the internet. We're talking about making media. We're talking about using media as a device to uh, carry your point of view into the world and connect you with the people that share that point of view or want to learn that point of view. And the packet loss that happens between intangible and tangible, you know, for me to be talking my own book and David's book here, that is, uh, something you combat with great communication. So, you know, what you're thinking about your ability to get to get that to the market in the highest fidelity is definitely, um, a function of how good of a communicator you are. So become a great writer, you know, use design to add context to your ideas and you have a much better shot at forming this personal monopoly than, um, you know, somebody doesn't have those skills. So these, these concepts just layer on top of each other for me. And that's why I think David and I have had a great exchange in formulating these ideas and trying to articulate how we both see this, uh, how we both see this concept working because what you're really doing is, is closing that gap by increasing your ability to communicate. It gives you um, a much more, effective medium to reach the market. So to use another economic analogy, there's the, you know, there are commodity goods, there are luxury goods. And uh, in the same way that those three layers combine to make something unique, the way that is, uh, the way that's distributed in the market, I think follows the same pattern. So you have commodity ideas, commodity content that you can get anywhere. And, you know, I'm using a physical product analogy here. So on the left hand side, there's 100,000 versions of this thing. Um, and obviously, interest dissipates among that 100,000 versus on the right hand side, you have this one off product limited supply. So the equation flips entirely. So your ability to lean into and combine those three things is going to drive you towards the right hand side of this spectrum, which is going to increase uh, demand as a function of reducing supply. If you're the only person in the world that can do X, you control the market, you control the price, you control 
you know, the amount of people that are going to come to you for that perspective. So this is the goal is to get to the right hand side of this diagram. So how do you get there? Where do you start? How do you think about this? Uh, one of my favorite quotes that um, summarizes this process it may be a cliche, but it's very, very excellent in this context is this quote from Steve Jobs, where he talks about connecting dots, looking backwards. So I think this was in reference to, um, I, th I think this was originally said in the context of him going to a typography lecture and that spark forming this passion in the back of his mind to then add um, the typographic control to the Mac applications that they were developing years and years later. So this quote, he really just talks about trusting your intuition to the extent that your curiosity is going to draw you towards the things that are going to allow you to make unique um, products, content, whatever it is you're in pursuit of having the faith that your curiosity is going to be uh, the most powerful device to seek that out is, is something that I think, you know, this is what is Apple, the most valuable uh, company in the world at this point, this is a, a sort of a testament to that process being uh, at the, at the center of this philosophy. So my final couple of slides here, are just trying to sear this methodology into your brain. This is what I've been using since uh, I started to think about the world this way, and it's been extremely helpful. This idea of dice. And what I mean by that is this process of divergence initially. So you're in the Steve Jobs quote, so you can only collect the dots, look, connect the dots looking backwards, sorry. So the first part of that process is to collect dots. That's, you know, pursue the things you're interested in. What is tangentially related to this thing that got me super passionate about it in the first place. The first part of that process is really just collecting all that information. So it's divergence. The second part of that journey is connecting those dots is convergence, right? So the, um, essentially the retrospective ability to connect dots. So I started my career in, in, New York about 10 years ago, worked in a bunch of different environments, a lot of jobs that I honestly didn't, wasn't that passionate about or interested in at the first place, but there was a nugget of something somewhere along the journey that got stuck. Uh, you know, worked on software in one place, worked on advertising in another place, like bus advertisements in another place. All these like weird little experiences came together to form this, you know, package of experiences and perspectives that allow you to then concentrate and emerge. So the idea of DICE being you know, a semi acronym of this thing is um, a helpful framework I find to sort of locate yourself within that journey too, because you're going to be somewhere along the spectrum at any point in time. And obviously, once you've connected the dots, there is even that process of adding to that composition that you figured out over time. So Visualized value in, in my case, is not a finished product by any means. There is still plenty of dot collection going on, but the ability to sort of coalesce those things and package them in stages as you continue to collect dots is something that I think you know, helps frame up this, uh, this journey that, um, you know, that you don't wake up one day and have this figured out. It really is a process of discovery and packaging and refinement. Dice. Keep Jack, can you talk a little bit about, I, I love this DICE framework. It's so good. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the emergent properties of visualized value? I mean, when I first met you, you were still working at, at an advertising agency and you were working with mostly some car companies and some other high-end brands. And, you know, as I was preparing for this workshop, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was to judge the work that you did from the agency, from what has stayed the same and what has changed. And you've always taken a very simple approach to design, lots of thin lines, easy to read typography, ideas that really speak for themselves rather than trying to get really fancy with design. But once you started to move on to visualize value, one of the things that you did was you picked a font 
and you picked black and white with a splash of green as an accent color whenever you needed it. So talk about the emergence for you and then also reference that Tim Ferriss quote in terms of mm. the brand side of building a personal monopoly in terms of making decisions. Yeah, so let's start with that, that Tim Ferriss quote. He said, make a single decision to eliminate a thousand decisions. And that to me was the complete opposite, the complete contrarian, uh, the complete contrarian view of the environments that I'd come from. So uh, in a creative agency, every day, 80% of the work you're doing is kind of this meaningless stylistic exploration, as opposed to the process of refining an idea or making something communicate more effectively, efficiently, etc. So that little truth, I think, is, is where you reach this inflection point. So the ability to say, I found a um, I found a set of rules that's working for me. And then I'm going to start to um, just push the limits as far as I can within these rules flips the um, it flips the onus onto you to be creative and to be um, to improve your own skill set within the constraints you've set as opposed to uh, like returning to the blank page every morning and having this like uh, this relationship with your work where it isn't compounding at all. So the, I think the, the inflection point where you see that emergence happening is, okay, I, I've, I've made a decision that this, that I'm not going to break these rules from here. I have, you know, a thousand different ways to iterate on this set of rules that I've, um, that I've at least found some appetite for in the market. And then from there, you really can, expand um you can expand at, at this unnatural rate because there's i mean there's so many things working for you i think equity in terms of people recognizing your work or your style or your um you know the consistency of the ideas you talk about this isn't necessarily graphic design right it could be i mean to use an example like dave portnoy this guy's not a graphic designer, but you know, when you read a tweet from Dave Portnoy, you know, when what he's going to say when he gets on a live video, right? He's found the point of emergence and he's just going after it every single day. And I think that is, uh, the, it's, it's kind of unnatural, but to go back to the product metaphor, the personal monopoly, you have to understand what your product is and lean into it. I think you can you you could find any company in the world that has succeeded and I think that's you know what's the killer feature of our product or what's the you know the killer benefit to our customer we're going to lean into that as hard as we possibly can I think in the case of visualized value that is uh, how do you visualize something to make it simpler uh, and anything outside of that is superfluous to our mission so let's strip away all of the things that we could waste time on that don't drive us towards that outcome and really lean into that. And I think that's true of, um, that's true of anybody that has found this level of specificity and resonance with their audience, their customers, et cetera. So, uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, again, the hindsight, the hindsight bias that you have in this situation is also interesting because, um, I was, I was really leaning into that visualized value methodology and approach for probably a period of time where people would think, why are you still doing that? You know, it took uh, like three, four, five months of just doing it every day as a practice to, for it to show up with external validation. I think, you know, the culture that we exist in, you think if I don't get it on day one, then it doesn't work. But, um, the other side of this coin is, is this practice making you better as a practitioner? So there's some, again, contrarian way to look at that, where you have a selfish approach to honing your skills. And as a result of you being selfish in pursuit of your skills, you create a better product for the market too. Yeah, one of the things, Jack, just my last question for you is, 
you know, you're talking about creating a better product for the market. And one of the things that I think is really important is just to be listening. And so in what ways has listening to others and listening to the symphony of feedback that you get informed your work and the strategy that you have when you build visualized value? Yeah, great question. So um, I think what is very interesting about content as a vehicle and the idea of a personal monopoly is you are essentially coalescing a group of people that share at least a slice of your worldview. So the content that you produce as a result of what you're thinking about, what you're working on, what you're personally curious about is a magnet for people who think similarly to you. And that doesn't necessarily mean you've cracked it on the product side, right? It means you've tapped into a common um, feeling of some kind. It's then your job to dig into what that is. And I think in the case of visualized value, there um, the ideas that we're translating into these visuals attracted people that were, for the most part, in pursuit of some agency of some kind. So whether they're building businesses, whether they're you know trying to uh, instill these mental principles that make the world a easier place to navigate, those are the type of people you attract, and then really spending time with those people and understanding what they need to make the next step in that journey informs how we build products, how we iterate on content, what we're talking about. So it's, uh, there's this principle in the build once sell twice course called make noise and listen for signal. And that's essentially the distillation of this principle. It's you just keep talking about the things that you're interested in. And then as soon as uh, you get this, you know, even slight level of like consistent response to something, you're onto something to the degree that you should investigate. And then the product of that investigation normally is insight that you can turn into an even better way to serve your customer, your reader, your viewer, whatever the, um, whatever the context is in, in your business or your, your life. I love it. I love that. Make noise and listen for signal. I think that's a, a really good like flag to plant and just some just a principle to build upon. I'm going to hop in to basically share a bunch of slides that now build off of everything that Jack said above. And then as I present, Jack and Anna will pop in with comments. So I want to talk about, of course, what are the principles of building a personal monopoly. And I want to start big picture because, you know, whenever somebody comes up to you and says, I have this idea, you have to ask what changed about the world. You have to ask that question because you have to say, well, why doesn't this thing exist already? And, you know, there was a book that I read a couple years ago. It's called The Sovereign Individual. Great book. And this book was written in the late 90s, and it's just this unbelievable distillation of how the world has unfolded. I mean, it just blows your mind. And, you know, there's one sentence that I just put the book on the floor, and I said, that's it. That is what we should be doing. And it was the greatest source of wealth will be the ideas that you have in your head talking about this new internet age that we're moving to. And as I've reflected on the book, you know, I've had to ask what changed? I gotta answer this question. Three things, globalization, computers and robotics, and everybody is internet connected. And so this is the frame for this idea of a personal monopoly. When I was working my first job, I was getting paid nothing. I was getting paid $45,000 a year living in New York City, the most expensive city in one of the most expensive cities in the world. And it was hard to pay my rent for, for living in New York. It's really tricky. And throughout that time, I was saying, you know what? My work is going to be replaced by somebody else. If, unless I'm talented, unless I can do something that nobody else is able to do, my career is at risk. And so in a state of, quite frankly, fright and panic, 
I said, you know what, we're moving to this world with global customers as a benefit, but global competitors as the drawback. And this, my friends, is the challenge that we face in our careers. What the internet does is it gives us gifts just as it takes away the things that we once took for granted. And so I was looking at my site analytics this morning from the last week. All these blue countries are places where people have visited my site in the last seven days. Almost every country in the world, save probably 25 in the last week. And so what I can do is I can sit at this little desk in the middle of Texas. I can just move my fingertips. And then ideas zip around the world at the speed of light seven times per second. And they land in the palms of all these people. Magic. United States, India, United Kingdom, Canada, Germany, Australia, France, Nigeria, Singapore. Unbelievable. That is the gift that we have all been given. And then... There's computers and robotics. You know, last summer I had the opportunity, two summers ago, I guess at this point, I had the opportunity to go to Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn is where the Ford factory is. And this is an old photo of the factory. You know, factories, they used to be loud. They used to be dirty. Men all over the factory floor, making stuff with their hands, lifting heavy things. Hard work, really hard work. And all of a sudden, these assembly lines began to change. You began to have many more different kinds of people on the factory lines. People of all different genders, and colors, and from all over the world. People beginning to work in a factory that was no longer super loud, where the assembly line was much simpler, where the cars could move instead of the people. And this is what I saw when I was in, in Dearborn, Michigan. I said, oh my goodness, this is where the world is going. The machines are beginning to do more. And yesterday, I was driving through Austin. And I looked to my right, and I saw a giant new building. The guy I was with says, that's the new Tesla factory. What does that look like? Silent. Humans. Nowhere. New world, computers running the show. One machine learns something, the rest of the machines automatically get those ideas. New world. That is computers and robotics. And this world rewards systems, reward systems builders over systems implementers. And so you look at these factories and you say, well, David, I don't have access to a factory. What are you talking about? You know what I say? You're dead wrong because an army of robots is freely available. It's just packed in data centers for heat and space efficiency. So use it. All of us right now, whenever we post something on Facebook, share something on Instagram, tweet something, publish an article, you get to use the robots. They just don't look like the walking robots that you saw in the movies, they look like this, but they're robots. They work for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, basically free. And so what you see is now because of the internet changes, because of the way the internet is now in our pockets, we all have smartphones, everybody is a media company. And this came to life for me in 2016. I was traveling in Chile on New Year's Day, checking out these old hieroglyphics with my family, go up to the guy at the front and do what I always do when I travel. I'm in rural Chile. I'm in Northern Chile, Atacama Desert, driest place in the entire world. Go up to the guy at the front. I say, hey, we'd like to uh, you know, have, some, have some lunch. What do you recommend? Oh, my friends, there's, there, there, there's nothing that's open within two hours of here. It's New Year's. Everything's closed. Uh-oh, I'm pretty hungry. I'm hangry at this point. I'm, I'm in a bad mood. And this guy calls his friend. This was her. She lives 40 minutes away. 
And he says, drive to the end of this road. You'll end up in this town. There's no paved roads once you get here. And everyone lives in these, in these huts, basically. There's no internet access. And there's rocks on all the buildings. So we're like, okay, you know, sounds like an adventure. So we walk up to this woman's place. This is her backyard filled with alpacas, no internet. And, you know, I'm sitting there and I start asking her, you know, how do you communicate with the world? Well, there's no cell service there. There's no internet. Her life, her experience is entirely constrained in this world of 150 people or so. She hadn't left the town at least more than 20 miles out, she said, in like five years. And for us, we live in a different world. You can sit here and you can just tap your fingers and reach all these different people. That is the gift that you have been given by the internet. Because writing online is like having a personal agent working for you 24 seven, who travels the world and finds opportunities for you for free, for free. And so as we talk about personal monopolies, this is what we are thinking about. We are here to become citizens of the internet. And so when it comes to what changed, we start with globalization. We think about global computing, maybe some robotics, and then everybody, every single person here is internet connected. So that we need to know in terms of building our personal monopoly. And this idea was inspired by this quote from the famous musician, Jerry Garcia, who once said, you want to be the only person who does what you do. And so on one hand, oh my God, I'm so inspired. On the other hand, you're like, well, how in the world do I make that happen? How do you do this? And the famous chess player, Jose Raul Capablanca, he once said, to begin, you must study the end. So that's where we're going to begin. So let's start at the end, and I'm going to walk you step by step back to exactly how you can do this. So what you're going for is what I call the personal monopoly cues. You're trying to build skills that are complementary, so they reinforce and amplify each other. Unusual skills or knowledge that are found together. Experiential skills gained through experience. And specific, where the more narrow and niche, the better. So complementary, you want them all to work together. Unusual, you should be able to have something where you look and, and other people say, you know, I've never met someone like that. Experiential, what's great about, you know, Jack worked for what, eight, 10 years in an advertising agency in order to have that same skill in terms of the experience, other people need to spend that time in the advertising world. Time is the greatest competitive advantage of all time because there's nothing you can do to speed up time in normal life, right? And then specific, a personal monopoly should be clear and as sharp as a pin. And so what we're trying to do here, and this is where you begin, is not to say, oh, I haven't gotten to the personal monopoly and stress out about that, but to just try to find your personal monopoly path. And then you walk this path towards the beautiful view at the end that we'll get to. And you got to remember, it's going to take years to build a personal monopoly, but that means that you should start now. And I want to share this video with you. And I love this video. It's really short. And I think it explains our mindset very well that we need to have. The world is a very efficient place, right? There's lots of podcasters. There's lots of runners. There's lots of TV shows. There's lots of writers. The world is very efficient. So the people who succeed are the ones who are irrationally passionate about something. So they're not doing it for the money. But you just need to be patient. This is the problem. It takes 10 years to build a career in anything. It takes, it takes 10 years to minimum to raise a child. It takes 10 years minimum to build a business. It takes 10 years to build a career. You're that irrationally passionate and patient. That's what we need to be looking for. What are we irrationally passionate about? Then how do we walk the personal monopoly path and know that once we do, things will work out for us if we can stay patient as we do it? So our short-term goal is to get on the personal monopoly path with the long-term goal being to get your personal monopoly. 
And my one of my favorite stories of this is because I've seen every single step along the path that is still unfolding is Ana Fabrega, who is here right now, where she joined as a rite of passage student and she had been a teacher. She was really upset with the education system. It wasn't fulfilling her. It wasn't paying her well. She saw a path to some kind of dead end. But at the same time, you know, she slammed her fists against the table and she said, you know what? I'm going to change this. I'm going to become an edupreneur and I'm going to start by improving childhood education. So this was the beginning of her personal monopoly. Called Anna up one day. I said, you know what? This is a great place to start. Let's keep building. And all of a sudden, she says, you know what? I'm actually going to get more specific. Use the internet to improve childhood education. And, you know, I said, I said to Anna and she began to realize, you know, that still wasn't, still wasn't quite enough. And so she joined a startup called Synthesis, which is inspired by the ideas of Elon Musk as their chief evangelist. She said, you know what, I'm going to use games on the internet to improve childhood education. And I want to just kick it over to Anna to just talk a little bit about her experience of what this was like going from the hopelessness and the anxiety to now a bit more certainty about what her future is going to look like because she's walking this personal monopoly path. Anna. Yeah. Thanks, David, for that intro. Do you mind sharing um, the Twitter screenshot? I like that so that I can sort of walk you through. Um, and yeah, it speaks to the personal monopoly part. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I just want to rewind a little bit. So about a year ago, um, a little bit over a year ago, I was sitting in Panama, very frustrated. I had recently quit teaching a job that I loved. I loved working with kids. I had been doing it for five years in different countries. I myself had attended 10 different schools growing up in seven different countries. So although I loved working with kids, I was really frustrated with my inability to transcend the education system, right? That's very outdated. Um, and so I quit. The only thing that I knew, I didn't really have a plan, was that I was gonna take Rite of Passage and sort of start building my online persona. Um, and at first I had all these ideas, but what I kept telling David and the different people um, in the community of Rite of Passage was, well, what, what's gonna make, what's my edge? Like, what's the difference? Because there's a lot of people out there writing about education, a lot of people that feel like me that are questioning the system. So what am I bringing to the table? What's different about my writing? What's interesting? And part of the process in Rite of Passage is finding your personal monopoly. And I thought it was gonna be that after one session, I was gonna have it all figured out. And I was texting David yesterday and I told him, wow, after an entire year, I finally feel like I have my personal, my personal monopoly in place. And this is really what's taken my writing and, my, and you know, has allowed me to build my audience and do all the wonderful things that I've been doing this past year. So if you look at my profile, and I'm just going to walk you through the different areas that Jack spoke about and that David spoke about and see how it comes to play in just one screenshot. So first you have my tagline that says, I get kids and kids get me. And that sort of gives you a sense of my personality and what I'm into and what um, Jack was talking about, the, um, your curiosity, right? Like what are the things that I like? I like working with kids. Then the, the cartwheel emoji gives you a sense of my personality, right? Like the character, what am I about? I have this very playful and childlike personality. So it's a subtle way to sort of show you that. Then the term edupreneur is a term that I coined last year when I was thinking, well, what do I want to do now? I want to start building different learning experiences in the alternative education space. I'm a really passionate educator outside the classroom. I like that word to sort of summarize that. Paired up with former teacher known by little ones as Ms. Fab. So my last name is Fabrega. My students started calling me Ms. Fab and I decided to make this my logo and to build my brand around it. And you can see the logo on the top right of my cover picture, very, again, colorful, goes with the vibe of my personality. It all goes in context. And then um, Chief Evangelist, which is, I recently joined Synthesis. Um, it's a ed education startup. We use a game-based approach to teach kids the things that they're not learning in regular school. Um, and and it's, it really goes with my mission and what I've been writing about for the past year. And then you have my pin tweaked which anyone that comes to my profile for the first time and they read that, it's a bit controversial, it's a bit thought provoking, and that's sort of the vibe that I'm going with with my writing. The whole purpose of everything that I do is to get people to think about education in a new way and start you know, 
asking questions about why we've been doing this for such a long time. Are there better alternatives? So that tweet sort of speaks to that. Um, so this that you see here is really the sum of who I am and what I do, and it's all in one screenshot, but it did take a year to get here. It took a year of thinking through this and thinking, well, what, what really moves me? What am I really passionate about? Like the video that David just showed, what am I irrationally passionate about and willing to work th through for the long term? Um, and yeah, by writing, and then David talks a lot about the content triangle, putting different ideas out there and seeing the feedback and how people respond to this. And that's really helped me come to terms to with who I am, what, what am I different, like what, what skills and what differentiates my content. And I realized that everyone has this. We all have that unique set of skills and interests that give us that edge, but we just have to think about it and work it through. And like Jack was saying, it's a process of discovering and refining, and this is where I am now. So the other slides that David created, if you want to move to those again, it sort of shows the, um, shows the progression of you know, I started with a very vague idea, right? Like I, I wanted to rethink education, come up with something different, but that was not enough. Like, what am I gonna do about that? Then with David, we started sort of an online summer camp. I started exploring this idea of the cohort-based model and actually getting kids to find their own personal monopoly and start thinking about these things that make them unique, that make them different. And, you know, those skills that they have that other people don't. But then we moved it up another notch, which is what if we use games? in the internet online to actually teach kids. And, and I don't mean like, oh, making school like a game. I mean like actually creating a game and that's how kids are learning. And that's what I'm doing now at Synthesis. Um, and it's really part of my evolving process. So I'm sure that if we talk again in a year, my personal monopoly is gonna have evolved to something else at that point, so. Fantastic. So Anna, if, if you have any questions, she will be with us in the Q and A and she led me in perfectly to the content triangle, which begins with an idea called the creator path. And, you know, I want to walk you through on this personal monopoly path. Like what are the different signposts to think about? And what we've spoken about is the first one, which is discovery. And this is where we're going to begin. And I'm going to show you what do you do to actually discover your personal monopoly? So, what, from what Anna was saying, the last year, this was the phase that she was in. Then we're going to talk about income. And we're going to talk about how you can use a personal monopoly to earn more, either in employment or in entrepreneurship. Neither one is better than the other. It's really just about what is your personality type. And both personal monopolies can be fantastically successful. Fantastically successful. But... In both, they are best when you get to a place where you are building equity. I guess I have a find and replace on my screen. So let me get that off. There we go. And so this begins with a quote from Cal Newport. And he says, rather than believing they have to start with a big idea or plan out a whole project in advance, they make a method methodical series of little bets about what might be a good direction, learning critical information from lots of little failures and from small but significant wins. This rapid and frequent feedback allows them to find unexpected avenues and arrive at extraordinary outcomes. And so that's where we begin the discovery phase, where this is what Jack said. This is what Anna said. We're writing about what you're inherently interested in is the best way to make unexpected discoveries. And Anna led me right into it. That begins with the content triangle. So, you know, there's this, there's this challenge where how do you actually develop new ideas? What do you have to do? And the problem is writing takes a ton of time. It, it just takes forever. It frustrates me, it might frustrate you, and it's hard. And so what we do though in our daily life is we have conversations. And so rather than treating conversations as uh, I'm just gonna sit back and you know kill some time with friends, what if your conversations could be really interesting and actually help you develop ideas and learn? So what you find is you have conversations, you're at a coffee shop with a friend at a restaurant, somebody says, hey, that that was a really good idea. And then, you know, happened the other night for me, actually. 
I said something and then I said, you know what, I'm going to share this. And so maybe you share it on Twitter, maybe you share it in your email newsletter, something that's low cost, right? Something you're going to type up. It's not going to you know, be on your website forever, nothing like that. You just share it. So then you share it and all of a sudden you start getting feedback. Some people respond here. They say, you know what, Th that's really interesting. But th I, I had this one question and another person says, you know, you might want to add this because then people start adding things and then all of a sudden you write an article about it. So now you've written an article about it. You're, you're building on the feedback of everybody. And instead of just being like Thoreau, who in order to write Walden, he goes to Walden Pond for two whole years, escapes from all of society just to write something. What you're doing is you're actually in the water, the waves of conversation. And you are having conversation, feedback, sharing, feedback, creating feedback, feedback, feedback. Then you end up at a place where by the time you publish a book, you've gotten all this feedback on through all of these iterations. And as you do, this is what Jack was talking about. You realize that you don't exactly find a niche. What the content triangle allows you to do is move towards that zone where you don't have a lot of people competing with you. And so you don't find a niche, but you create one. And so I wrote an article about this recently where I said, when you build a personal monopoly, you are creating demand for an idea people didn't know they were interested in. The most successful creators tend to define their own subculture instead of molding themselves into existing ones. You know, in 2017, I didn't sit down and say, hey, I wish there was somebody who had some beautiful drawings and did an amazing job visualizing ideas. That thought never entered my mind. Then last year, I was walking in Mexico City with Will, Will Manon, and he goes, dude, you got to check out this guy, Jack Butcher. I'm like, who is Jack Butcher? And he goes, who is that? And he goes, oh, uh, this, this, this amazing, basically like Twitter artist. He's a designer and I've never seen anything like it. Wait, well, well, that sounds interesting. So then I go, you know, I pick up the book. I say, wow, this is amazing. I start following him on Twitter. See all this sort of stuff. And so what Jack did in terms of building his personal monopoly was he actually created his own niche. The same thing that Anna did, created her own niche. And so I want to give you some more examples. You know, one of my students, his name is uh, Packy McCormick. And when he joined Rite of Passage, it, you know, it was amazing to watch because he started off, this was his original site. And he said, you know, I run this thing called the Not Boring Club. And he writes this semi-weekly Not Boring newsletter on business strategy and pop culture. What's really interesting is you can actually see the seeds of his personal monopoly in this original site. And now, this morning, I went on his site. It's so much more clear. It's so much more simple. And he's all about the not boring idea. He just says, business strategy and finance, but 100% not boring. That's killer. The most fun way to learn what's going on in business. Then there's on Laura, huge fan of her work. And she was working all these corporate jobs. And she said, you know what? I'm really interested in something called mindful productivity. I'm going to coin that term. And I'm going to use science and researching and kind of research and combine that with mental well-being and overall health and wellness. And I'm going to take those two things and boom, write about productivity. And now I have my personal monopoly. You know, I'm also a huge fan of Julia Galef. She is, she, she used to run a podcast called the Rationally, well, I guess now she runs the Rationally Speaking podcast. And she used to run a podcast with a guy named Massimo Pellucci, who was my third ever podcast guest. So he introduced me to Julia. And when it comes to like reasoning and thinking clearly and just using more logic in the way that you move through the world, she has this killer personal monopoly. When it comes to how to think more clearly, I always go to Julia. Her Rationally Speaking podcast is fantastic. There's no one else in the world who does it like she does. And then we can also leave the world of writing. And when I was living in New York, I had a friend and his roommate 
was this guy, his name was Eric Lewis. And I had heard that he was some sort of big deal, but I actually, I didn't know. And he was kind of always out of the house. And like, whenever he was at the house, he was just really chilling. You didn't talk much. I was like, okay, whatever. And one day I actually heard a podcast that he was on. He was interviewed by Eric Weinstein. And I was like, this is Eric Lewis. He's amazing. And what he did was he didn't find a niche. He created one. And so let me explain. Here's what I wrote in that article. Rather than playing the piano conventionally, he reached inside the piano and pulled the strings directly instead of actually touching the keys. And through the force of that niche, he combined the energy of rock with the improv improvisational aspect of jazz. You gotta look up one of his videos. This guy is one of the top piano players in the world right now. And this all out performer and his personal monopoly is the energy of rock, the improv of jazz and soul like you've never seen before. And what I learned is the reason that he was so calm and just casual when I, whenever I met him was because he, when he plays this guy is an outrageous presenter and just saves all of his energy for that. And through this personal monopoly, he created the niche of rock jazz. So when it comes to building our personal monopoly, Anna said it, Jack said it, we see it with Elu, we see it with all of these people. Got to be specific. How do we do that? Well, I think of it like a, what I guess I would call a three pinch personal monopoly. And so in order to find that, you take three things, and you zoom in on it three times with pinches, the three by three rule. So the best metaphor for this in terms of the pinches is Google Maps. So you look back and you know, if I were to look at France on Google Maps on my phone, this is what you see, right? You don't see a lot of detail, it's just, you got some highways and stuff. You see Paris smack dab in the middle, Belgium, Luxembourg, London, all the way up there. You zoom in. Oh, cool. Now I can see Paris. I can see the suburbs of Paris, all the roads, the River Sienne that runs through the city. But, you know, I still don't know a lot about this city. Where are the good parks? Where's the Eiffel Tower? How about the Louvre? Ah, let's zoom in. Okay, now I'm beginning to see what's going on. And now we're getting to the stuff of a personal monopoly where you're actually zooming in on your idea and you're seeing things that the casual observers would have never seen because you're spending the time in here, right? But now look at what happens. You actually get into an idea and you have what I call an intellectual phase transition where instead of map view that's sort of abstracted, you begin to see the world in high fidelity street view. You actually go into the map and you can see the details that someone who was way out would have never seen before. And that's why you go in, you get specific and things begin to emerge that you would have never seen. And Jack is actually a really good example of this where Jack started off in terms of his first pinch, that last really zoomed out view was just design. That's it. And then he actually jumps into communicating ideas with design. And he says, you know what? That's actually not enough. I'm gonna do another pinch into the map and I'm gonna use the internet to communicate ideas with simple design. And then he has this intellectual phase transition, boom, visualize value. And that right there is like that vivid picture of the Eiffel Tower. You actually see an opportunity that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. So once again, another visualization, we start with design, communicating ideas with design, using the internet to communicate ideas with simple design. So what should we remember? What should we learn from Jack's story? You know, Jack says, get good, get going, then get good. And so a lot of people are stuck on this personal monopoly path because they look at the end and they're like, you know what? I'm not there yet. I'm just gonna be a perfectionist. I'm not gonna do anything. And then there's the procrastinators. And look, the perfectionists, the procrastinators, they don't do much. But watch what happens with the iterators. 
they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. And then later on, things begin to work for them. And Jack said, you know, it took me a while. Anna said, it took me a while. It took me, David Pearl, it took me years to begin to find my purse monopoly. But what allows people to find their purse monopoly is walking this personal monopoly path. Jack, any, any comments, anything that you want to build on? I was so much in there. Um, I think there was a few notes I took over here that I think there were so many slides ago that it might be, it might be like dropping us back in a, like a weird place context wise. But the, when you were talking about the building of the factory, that was towards the beginning of the start of your presentation, the, uh, there was a tweet, um, Elon Musk made about three weeks ago. And it was a reply to somebody who was essentially criticizing the fact that Tesla's share price is what it is based on their manufacturing numbers. And he's like, it doesn't look like a car company to me. It looks like a factory company. And uh, Elon replied, he said, the factory is the product. And I think that uh, analogy, even for what we're talking about here is very interesting. It's like, what is the methodology that you are, um, or what, what are all your experiences converging to become that, that become the mechanism for producing things if that makes sense. It's kind of an abstract idea, but I think that to me is you're not thinking about just the end product. You're thinking about what it is you do uniquely to produce that product. So there's like an intellectual factory that you are consistently upgrading the equipment of and the products that come off the line of that factory get more refined, like more well received by the market, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, again, refine the process, like the process becomes your, um, the process is really the product and then the things that the process produces are really just sort of milestones in that journey. That was one of the notes I made. The other, the other was uh, engineers and entertainers. Like this is bifurcation. Like there's essentially two jobs at the end of this like massive transition. You're either building the things or you are existing on the platforms, creating the things that are holding the attention of others. So that whole metaphor about economics like this is all an attention game right like the in the same way that money flows towards the most refined or the you know the most appropriate i should say product the same applies on the internet it's like how do you find um how do you find how do you carve out your content market fit there's another great example of a guy i think he wrote a newsletter about amazon literally a new a weekly newsletter about the company amazon and I think within a few months, he's making six figures a year. And the specificity of that, I think a lot of people will be scared of that level of specificity. But I think the, um, that to me is one of the mental shifts that makes this, uh, makes this journey easier is understanding that the longer you resist specificity, the longer it's going to take you to get a hold on this thing. It's, I think it's a, we falsely optimize. I want to stay broad. I don't want to shut off any opportunity, but in staying broad, you never go deep enough to get the resonance you need to actually hit that emergent phase. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to build on this personal monopoly path idea. And this is one of the things that Jack has really gotten to understand well, which is, okay, we focused on discovery, which is what I really focus on in Rite of Passage. Well, now what happens? How do we actually get income from this? And how do we begin to benefit? And like I said before, there's really two opportunities here. There's employment and there's entrepreneurship, and both are fantastic and work really well. And so with employment, you know, there's actually so many examples that I'm just going to talk about my friends. And so the two are Alex Danko, who through writing online now became 
like a, almost like an evangelist, just like Anna for Shopify. And he was writing and writing and he attracted the attention. I wouldn't be surprised if the CEO of Shopify and they brought him on. And now he gets to do a lot of writing there. And it's one of the fastest growing companies in the world right now. And then there's my friend, Nick Majuli, who 2016, he was working at a litigation consulting firm in Boston. He's thinking to himself, he was thinking to himself, I don't want to do this anymore. I got to get into finance. That's what I want to do. So New Year's Day, 2017, he looks himself in the mirror and he says, I'm going to get going, then I'm going to get good. He says, I'm going to start a blog called Of Dollars and Data, and I'm going to publish every single Tuesday and never miss a week. And it is now more than three years later, and he's never missed a single Tuesday. He's now the chief operating officer at Ritholtz Wealth Management, which if I was working in the finance industry, I'd make a beeline for their front door and I'd say, I would love to work here. And now he's their COO. And he focused with that personal monopoly on what is the intersection of writing, investing, which is the dollars and data. Just that intersection. And just like what Jack said, I'm going to be specific. So that's employment. Then there's entrepreneurship. And Jack says, whatever the content is on the front end, there's an opportunity for product on the back end. And he very famously says, build once, sell twice. So build and communicate skills with content and then monetize them with the product. Build and communicate skills with content. So that's how you actually advertise to the world. Hey, I can help. And you've built these skills. Look at the world. Look at all the things that are messed up, things that don't work well. All of us look at the news and we're just like, oh my goodness. And from that, I say you have a duty. If you are talented. And if you are skilled, you have a duty to tell the world how you can help. And like Jack said, to become a magnet for like-minded people so that you can get involved and work on the highest potential projects for yourself. Hey, David, can I just interject quickly? Yes, sir. My friend. Because I think there's also a, uh, there's a risk reduction process in play here too where content can be the vehicle for sourcing these one-to-one -one engagements so if you're a designer writer consultant engineer that has a very specific focus content uh visualized value essentially began as a lead generation tool for one-on-one -on -one consulting clients like here's the design style that i practice do you want to hire me as a designer to implement this for you personally. So the scale doesn't tick, doesn't have to at least tick from, hey, I'm writing online and I'm selling X number of thousand products, products by month three. There is um, a really functional way to apply this as um, a method for sourcing work that doesn't scale first. Absolutely, thank you, Jack. And from that, you see that experience leads into building a product where you do something once and then you are replicating that over time. And this is exactly how Jack then can go from doing consulting with a bunch of different clients to then having a product where he's productizing himself. And so you know, this is now what I'm going to move into is equity. And this is the cutting edge of where all of this is going. And this is what I'm really interested in trying to figure out is how then do we build this equity portfolio? What are the different ways to actually have equity in a business? Because once you own a business, that is when there's real opportunities here to become that citizen of the internet, to become somebody who has that sovereignty 
because you have control in terms of reach, in terms of distribution, in terms of direct relationships with your audiences, anything like that, what are the different ways to actually get equity in what you're building so that we're moving beyond a salary into something bigger? And so the first option is to start a company. And now this one is hard. Like I, I, I run a school and it takes a lot of my creative time away from me. Now I also make a decision where I could start a business that would be more work, maybe like something like ConvertKit. ConvertKit is the platform that I use to send email newsletters. Nathan Berry, he's their CEO. He built an online audience really focused on the intersection of design and software and then building authority in a niche. And he said, you know what? I understand these people. He had that three pinch purse monopoly, went into that photo of Paris, went into that visualized value intellectual phase transition. And he said, you know what? I'm going to start an email platform called ConvertKit. And he says, look, I've been working on ConvertKit for seven years. I think that it's going to take me at least five more to build ConvertKit into a company worth $1 billion. So that's the first opportunity. Then Nathan wrote this amazing essay called The Billion Dollar Blog. And in it, he talks about another great example of somebody who started a company and was able to leverage the owned reach and distribution and unique perspective into building another billion dollar business. And that's Emily Weiss, a total legend. And he writes, Nathan writes about Emily, who's the CEO of Glossier, says, in the summer of 2010, Emily Weiss, a fashion assistant at Vogue, had the idea to start her own fashion blog. Into the Gloss showcased the real world beauty routines of fashion influencers and celebrities. The blog was an immediate hit. And by 2012, it received more than 200,000 visitors per month. From Into the Gloss, Emily created Glossier, the groundbreaking beauty brand now valued at over $1 billion. That's the power of an audience. So now Emily has taken the owned attention, her unique perspective, her personal monopoly. She's advertised it and shown the world, hey, come here, we have a unique perspective on beauty. And we're going to start a company around this. Another option is you can evangelize a company. This is a real emerging opportunity. And look, there's the sort of classic example of sponsorships. And my friend, Sarah Dietschy, she does this extremely well. She's really into technology and she's just got great taste. She's super fun. And when it comes to whenever I need anything tech related, I asked Sarah Dietschy and I say, the lens that you're looking at right now, I texted her, I said, Sarah, help me out. What is the best lens for this space? Sarah helped me out and she makes hundreds of thousands of dollars in sponsorships every year. So that's the sort of classic route. The one that I'm really interested in right now is what Anna's doing with Chief Evangelist, where you join a company, you become a part of what they're building. You don't sacrifice the creative potential, actually you add fuel to that fire of creativity and you say, I'm not going to be responsible for running this thing because that's going to take away from my creativity, which it will. There's always a trade-off there. But she says, you know what? Creativity is really important to me, but I believe in this and I can serve as an evangelist, somebody who, unlike a sponsor, is actually part of the heart, the soul, and the spirit of this company. And then the third opportunity here is investing, where Packy McCormick, one of my students who I spoke about earlier, he launched something called the Not Boring Syndicate. And he says the Not Boring Syndicate is the first to use a newsletter to generate deal flow, think in public, and bring the power of a targeted community to bear on early stage fundraising. And when Packy started off in Rite of Passage, the guy had almost no following, had written just a handful of followers, and now this is what they're doing. Typical investments of, of looks like 120,000, four deals in the last four, 12 months and 118 different limited partners. 
Then there's Lee Jin and her personal monopoly. The thing that she is going to become globally known for might even already be is the passion economy. What is the intersection of creators and internet businesses and people being able to actually make money from the things that they're passionate about? And now she's the founder and managing partner at her own early stage venture capital firm. And so to zoom out, what you see is this equity portfolio has different options. You can start a company, evangelize a company, or invest in a company. These are the different ways that building a personal monopoly can go to work for you. So what we see is all of these people, and this is where to begin, is walking the personal monopoly path. So what exactly do you do in order to walk that? Four C's basically, create, converse, consume, and clarify. So create, you write every day, you publish regularly. Converse, you talk to people who can improve your thinking. Remember the content triangle. You consume, you're expanding your knowledge through consumption, and then you're clarifying your personal monopoly. You're defining yourself in ever more clear and specific ways. And so when it comes to walking the path, you start walking by writing online and you ask yourself, what is the unique intersection of skills, interests, experiences, and personality traits? What is your unique intersection there? And then just like Jack was saying, you go from one to two to three, you need to layer on these skills. And what I wanna remind you about is that most people they don't even know this, that this path exists. And they aren't familiar with some of the ideas from something like the sovereign individual, which says the greatest, source, the greatest source of wealth will be the ideas you have in your head. And I just want to remind you of the fact that the sun is still rising and this is the view and the sun is still rising even at the view at the end of the path. So this is where we're going, but this is where we need to start. Thank you very much. So Will, what are the, the best questions from the last hour 17? Definitely, there's a few themes that emerged. We've had a ton of questions down in the Q and A. So uh, first question is on what you all are just talking about at the end there. You know, you don't want to be too broad for too long. You want to get specific. But Tushar asks, you know, the fear with going specific is that you go deep into this hole, and and what if it doesn't work, right? So how can you be confident when you're going to go deep that you've found the place to go deep? How do you all think about that? Yeah. So. The way that I would say this is that you always want to be listening for signals. So you don't want to just say, you know what, this is going to be my, my big plan and I'm just going to do this and have, and think it's all going to get figured out. What you want to do is just take all of these very small risk steps and then listen to what people are responding to, right? This is why the content triangle has multiple steps going up because you create and you listen, you create and you listen. And when people diverge and end up in a place that nobody is interested in, it's just because they weren't listening. But if you publish consistently and you listen and you seriously work hard to strive to improve, that will not happen. Perfect. Um, we had a thoughtful question earlier on from Cameron. Uh, Jack had been talking about, you know, diverge, then converge. You can't connect the dots looking forward. David had talked, though, about start with the end in mind. He thought there's a contradiction there. I um, wonder if you guys could clarify that. Jack, I know you had a few thoughts on this. And David, maybe you want to chime in as well. Yeah, I think there, uh, I think we're framing the same process from two different angles, essentially. So where David is talking about begin with the end in mind. I think that is um, the end would translate similarly to what we're talking about emergence here. So you're beginning with the understanding that you're in pursuit of finding things along the way. And David, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the end is not um, exactly where I'm going to end up, what I'm going to be talking about, what I'm going to be 
selling or where I'm going to be working. It's uh, recognizing the fact that I want to collect experiences and keep iterating on this feedback loop to get to that point. Exactly. So what I would tell you is I know with my end in mind that I am going to be building businesses and writing online as my strategy to do the things that I want to do in life. I know with basically 100% certainty, I'm doing that for the next 10 years, maybe more. I've always known that. But the actual specifics of this idea that I would go become the writing guy would have never guessed that. I don't know if Rite of Passage is going to become a writing school, an entrepreneurship school, a business school of the future. I would love that. That is my 10-year vision to have Rite of Passage be a business school of the future. But to the first question, I'm not going to be so high resolution with my end in mind that I don't then listen to what the world wants and what the world needs and what it's telling me. So it's start with the end in mind with really high resolution and maybe the meta principles of how you work, but also listening and iterating over time, just like what Jack said. So I don't think they're contradictory. Yeah. And just one more point. I think um, the, the two things to balance there are the feedback you're getting with the things that you can sustain personally. So definitely you take into account the feedback you get from the market. Um, I don't think it's always a literal transaction of feedback where you get say somebody's going to tell you, Hey, do this instead of that. Um, there's, there's this sort of painful gully phase where you go through, you know, um, for me being in an agency environment, being told exactly what to do was comfortable in some ways, but also like very creatively frustrating. And I think balancing the feedback you're getting with the things that you want to be doing those again is a, there's a, um, there's no hard delineation between those two things, but I would never abandon the process of, you know, creativity that the creativity that gives you the energy is always going to be the edge so it's kind of a sprinkle of feedback into that thing that's already fueling you Anna, do you have any thoughts on this of the ways that your purse monopoly has stayed the same versus the way it's changed um i guess that one thing that i've been thinking since you guys were talking about this was that and related to the question that came before those that think that going really deep in their niche is sometimes a bit scary or they don't know if people are going to be interested. And um, what I realized was that you don't, you, you sort of start playing with the content. And you guys talked about earlier about how what you're writing should reflect your interest, but also a little bit about what the world wants. So the way that I've done it is I'm really interested in kids and that's sort of like my irrational obsession, but that doesn't mean I'm writing about kids the entire time. I'm really interested in learning about ideas in different fields and always approaching it from the lens of a kid or how would a kid sort of like benefit from this. And then I write it in that way. And I realized that that sort of started to stick and that's where the content triangle comes in. That's what people started resonating with. So again, I am writing about what I'm interested in, but also it is what sort of people want to hear. Um, so I'm exploring ideas like big level ideas, but from the perspective of a child. So that's very niche but at the same time, um, it's, it's, it's in a way that it's still interesting to people who are maybe not that interested in kids particularly. So perhaps exploring that and trying different things out and seeing what resonates with your audience. So the number one theme from the Q and A was how to start out. If you're new, if you don't have a lot of followers, how do you get this whole engine into motion? So I think the best way to approach this question is from personal examples. Um, so we'd love for you guys to talk about anything you were doing uh, originally, an approach that wasn't working for you. So specific examples there, or how did you validate the concept behind visualized value, rite of passage, uh, Anna, your writing and, and synthesis. Yeah. So what I did, I mentioned before, I mean, I've always just sort of known, and it was just very obvious to me that writing online was such a huge opportunity because when I was in college, I remember reading a line from a tech writer named Ben Thompson. And he said, I remember it so well, he said, people cannot imagine the scale of the internet. And so I just said, you know what? I'm just going to spend my career just until it stops working, arbitraging the difference between how big people think the internet is versus how big it actually is. Like the simplest idea. And Munger, Charlie Munger says, 
take a simple idea and take it seriously. That's exactly what I did. I'm still doing it. I'm telling you right now. So I said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Now, what's the best way to do this? Okay, well, all the people I know about from the internet, what do they do? They write online. So if I write online, other people know about me. Super simple. And then I said, I am going to write every single day for 90 days or every single day for 90 minutes. And I'm never going to stop. I'm never going to stop. And so that's what I do. I took the insight. I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And then I just executed and I went and I went and I went and things began to emerge. 2018, end of the year, I tweeted that my, actually, when I first met Will, Will, tell the story of me at the Venice Whaler. <laughs> so David and I grabbed dinner, I guess, over two years ago, December, 2018. I'd been reading his newsletter. He was in LA. We, we uh, met up and he said, my ambition, I want to, I want to teach a dozen people how to be creators online. And that was sort of the big vision. <laughs> I said, okay, that's pretty cool. You know, I'd love to be involved in some way. Two weeks later, this guy tweets out, I want to teach a thousand people to write online next year. So in that two weeks, I don't know what happened, but the sites went up from a dozen to a thousand and, and here we are. But uh, David. So what happened, <laughs> so what happened was I was sitting, I remember sitting on my, sitting on my couch, my old apartment in Brooklyn. <laughs> and, uh, and I just tweeted, I want to teach people to write online. DM me if you're interested in, in doing that. And I got so many DMs from this. I probably had, you know, 6,000 email subscribers, 8,000 Twitter followers at the time. And I was just like, okay, I struck a chord. And you just sort of know, like you just say things and you're like, okay, something happened here. So then I started write a passage and I said, I'm just going to teach people to do what I've done. Did it first cohort, you know, maybe we had 50, 70, hundred people. Next cohort had a third of that. And I, I, I kid you not, I thought that I had, it, I had reached the entire market of the world for how many people wanted to write online. And that at this point, I needed to start a whole new business and change and find a new personal monopoly. Meeting with a friend. And she said, that's not true. You're not thinking about this. Well, just keep going. Third cohort, I hire Will and Will goes, dude, I have all these ideas. Like we can make it so much better. And so then... Will comes on, third cohort ends up doing really well. Anna was in that. And now I just switched. I just realized there's actually a lot of energy around this writing concept. There's a huge opportunity to be the global writing teacher. And now then that is becoming this emergent personal monopoly, similar to what Jack said. But from that story, like this was not planned at all. But the meta principles were, and those meta principles will work for you. Find something you're uniquely interested in, publish all the time, listen for feedback, don't stop. Yeah, and I guess I would add to that, that it always helps, especially at the beginning when you don't have an audience and you're sort of trying different things out to see what resonates, um, to have... To, to keep in mind, what is the reaction that you that you want to sort of cause in the audience through your writing, whether it is a tweet, a video, or whatever it is that you're putting out there. For me, my goal was really to get people to stop and think about education in a different way. So I always aimed for my tweets to either be something that people would, you know, I would, I would always aim for to cause an impression, like either you're interested or it's a bit controversial and you're sort of like, wait, what is she talking about? Both those reactions lead for you to stop and think about what I'm talking about. So I really had that in mind and that helped me publish content that was aligned with my goal. So keeping that in mind. And then again, trying different things out and seeing what language and what tone um, makes people, you know, relate to what you're writing about. That was really helpful for me, especially at the beginning. I, I can uh, reflect a little bit on, I think, what worked and the lessons I learned in my early career as a designer were always, um, that your currency in that world is a portfolio. So I think the principle that was drilled into my head really early on in my career was nobody cares about what institution you um, attended to learn X. They care about what you can do. So try to distill this into a, a line. N nobody cares what you can do. Everybody cares what you can do for them. So 
in a design interview, you show up with a portfolio. If you don't show up with a portfolio, that you know, there is really no point for you to show up. So taking that principle, building a body of work with a very specific outcome in mind. So what do I want somebody to think when they see my body of work? Not just, oh, this person is, you know, this person has a good sense of taste and they can, uh, you know, they can make something look pretty, which is essentially the takeaway in a lot of cases when you look at a design portfolio. As soon as I pivoted to this idea of, I want to build a portfolio of work that somebody who has something really complex to communicate looks at and it's like, I need to hire this person. And as soon as I changed my focus to having a body of work that demonstrates an outcome, everything changed. So perfect, Jack, you talked earlier in the workshop about personality being the hardest part uh, to layer on. And somebody had a question, it probably applies to a lot of people. If you're a writer or creating something and you've got competence down, you're getting some curiosity mixed in, but having trouble shifting and really expressing your personality, any advice uh, any of y'all have for how to let your, your unique personality shine through in the work that you do? David, you're on mute. Do you want, I can start there. All right. Um, I think one huge caveat is a game of reps. Like I am from a small town in England, definitely not a culture of going out and projecting your every thought to the world every time you have one. And I think you kind of layer these things on in the order that I tried to illustrate them. So as you find your competence and your curiosity, that confidence starts to build. So if it's a, a piece of information that you have that, as David described, is this art, like this demonstration of arbitrage, you have way more confidence to share that because you know you're doing, um, you know you're providing value. You're, you are um, yeah, providing service in some way. So I think a lot of those things build on one another. So you can have personality and you can go and like be a comedian on Twitter. That's definitely not my uh, forte. Uh, but the confidence to be yourself, I think, comes from the depth of study, research, repetition, the amount of work you've put in, then um, sort of gives you permission to, or at least in my case, I feel like it gives me permission to speak uh, very candidly about how I discovered that information, what the process was. Uh, the, the work itself kind of unlocks that permission in my mind. I think um, we try and, you know, put the cart before the, the horse in some cases. And that's where we get, uh, that's where we start to stumble. Perfect. Uh, another question I want to ask about specificity. You know, it's a huge principle of everything we're talking about here is that the internet rewards specificity in a pretty dramatic way. So David, do you want to share any thoughts uh, on that topic in particular? Yeah, I think, so this will be the last, the last answer. And I'm reminded of a, a story because I know a lot of you are frustrated by this idea of like, how does specificity actually help? And, you know, the thing about specificity is it's really hard to actually predict what's going to happen. But being specific attracts like-minded people in a way that's just impossible to identify when you just go out on the streets. And like, I want to tell you just sort of through a story how specific we can actually get. So in 1977, there was a guy named Bill James. He was working at a security guard at Stokely Van Camp Pork and Beans Factory. He's working there. And in 1977, he publishes his first book. And it has the very exciting title of Baseball Abstract, featuring 18 categories of statistical information that you just can't find anywhere else. Talk about specific. Who's going to read that? So he puts this book out there. And, you know, it, it, the title's insufferably boring. The topic is painfully precise. But the good news is because it was so precise, it attracted a lot of readers. So what he does, he goes, he pays for an advertisement in a magazine called Sporting News. That first advertisement leads to 75 orders. Then 1978, he publishes the second edition, 
250 people read it. And of those 250 people, they're research scientists, they're university professors studying physics, economics, statistics, Wall Street analysts, math wizards, all these people who are influenced, obsessed with baseball, they want to learn about how Bill James thinks about the game. And then a guy named Billy Bean, who's the general manager for the Oakland A's, reads this book. And Billy Bean sees this, brings Bill James just into his intellectual orbit. And Billy Bean, through this book, transforms the game of baseball. And Bill James gets to be a part of that, kickstarts the statistics revolution that has defined sports for the last 40 years. And the key to Bill James's influence was that he wrote for a tiny group of people who were intensely interested in baseball, the statistics of baseball, how to think about baseball differently instead of for a mass audience. And that, what I call the paradox of specificity, where the more specific you go, the more opportunities you end up getting, is why as we walk our personal monopoly path, we want to be specific. We want to create, consume, communicate, and clarify. So thank you all so much for joining. We will have a, we'll have a full recording for you. We'll have notes. We'll send you slides. We'll see you on Twitter and really appreciate you being here. Thank you all, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.